Just a little introduction here from uh, John Cunningham for my slideshow about uh, the Northern McGrath clan and their many centuries of association with the oldest Irish Roman Catholic uh, pilgrimage uh, that is at uh, Loch Derg and uh, they were co-arbs to look after the monastery uh, for from around about the 1200s. Um, I'm a former headmaster of the local elementary school or primary school in this part of the world in Balik, County Fermanagh and I have uh, published over 50 books uh, so far and uh, about uh, 300 published articles and I have lived in this part of the world for over 70 years and uh, there are no shortage of McGraths in this part of the world. Anyway, enjoy the presentation and thank you very much. <laughs> Welcome to this presentation by John B. Cunningham, writer and historian, on Loch Derg pilgrimage and the Clan McGrath, the role of the Carb in medieval Ireland. We are very thankful to uh, John for compiling this uh, presentation in such detail and with wonderful information, which I'm sure you'll all find extremely interesting. I'll be providing the voiceover uh, for this slide presentation. My name is uh, Sean Alexander McGrath and I'm the Cian Finna of the Clan McGrath of Ulster. First a word on uh, John. Uh, John Cunningham is a writer historian and a tour guide in the British Isles and in Ireland. John has published over 50 books and over 300 articles to do with Irish history and heritage. John is an Irish national tour guide since 2003 and has contributed a huge amount to previous uh, clan gatherings, including uh, the writing of a number of books, which has included a history of the Clan McGrath. And we'll talk a little bit more about uh, John's books in this coming presentation. But our sincere thanks to John and all his efforts, not only in this presentation, but also previous gatherings and his contribution towards uh, preserving the history of the Clan McGrath so thank you uh, once again to John. So we're going to look at uh, the McGraths as carbs. Carbs are overseers of the ancient pilgrimage site of Loch Derg, also known as St Patrick's Purgatory. First of all, we need to establish what was a carb and the carb McGraths. Who were they and what were their responsibilities and how did they find themselves in this office with huge responsibilities. So in the early Irish and Scottish churches, the incumbent of an abbey or bishopric as successor to the patron saint or founder. So um, we have a saint who established um, a particular monastic settlement. And in Lochter, we know that the original saint um, was uh, St. Davog who was a follower of St. Patrick. We know historically the successor to the founder of the religious institution was known as the Carob. And we also know from history that the head of one of the families composing an old Irish sep would often take the role of Carob. So the Carob itself became a hereditary office, usually related to one particular family. They then became the overseers of the monastic settlement or pilgrimage site and it was their role and responsibility to look after that particular site and to act if you like as administrators of the site and of the pilgrimage. So where is uh, Loch Derg? On the right is a 1591 map of the area on the top left of the image is St Patrick's Purgatory with the River Derg going north. General direction from which the McGraths came 
from around the area of Carrick McGrath townland, which is quite close to the modern town of uh, Bully Buffet. The map also shows the estuary of the river, which lies southeast and links the forts of Belig and Bally Shannon. So let's take a closer look of one of the islands of Loch Derg and perhaps the most famous, Station Island. Station Island is the main pilgrimage site on Loch Derg and contains the main church and also the Purgatory Cave itself. We'll talk a little bit more about the cave uh, later. The map you're looking at is dated AD 1666 and gives us a broad geography of uh, Station Island. What you can see on the map on the uh, edge of the island is the accommodation for pilgrims. So there were a large number of pilgrims that could attend uh, the island uh, at any one time and they could be accommodated on the island itself. Uh, at the north end of the island is the largest building that you can see on the map is the uh, church. And just below the church um, is the penitential cave, that is the, the purgatory cave if you like. And this is where pilgrims uh, entered uh, for the uh, their penance. Uh, boats arrived from every uh, uh, direction and you can see that um, on the map itself, uh, boats are approaching the island from all uh, directions, uh, from uh, the mainland uh, itself. So the Annals of Ulster and our own tradition tells us that the uh, Loch Darn pilgrimage has its sources in the very early medieval period. But where do we see um, details of the pilgrimage uh, and of the pilgrimage island first written down? Well, we have to look back uh, to a Latin text written about 1180 to 1184. Uh, it is the Treatise on St. Patrick's Purgatory, which has been identified as written by a monk uh, who identified himself as uh, Hitch of Saltry. The author is traditionally known as Henry, and he was a Cistercian monk in Huntingdonshire in England. The Tractatus or the Treatise, tells of the journey of an Irish knight, Owen, a version of the Irish name Owen, to St. Patrick's Purgatory on an island in Loch Derg. He journeys through Purgatory and the earthly paradise via a cave on the island. Owen's journey is dated by Henry of Sultry to the reign of King Stephen of England between 1135 and 1154. So we looked at the, the Tracatus and uh, the story that it actually tells um, of a journey to uh, the purgatory. So the idea of purification or temporary punishment after death has ancient roots, as well attested in early uh, Christian literature. So the concept of purgatory as a geographical place is largely the achievement of medieval Christian piety and imagination. The scope of Henry of Saltry's story on the theological and literary planes is also extremely important. It was an expression of Cistercian spirituality and made a contribution towards the definition of purgatory as a place. It is not a vision but a journey to the other world undertaken by real people. Therefore this tale of adventure is also an historical value. This helps to explain the interest aroused by the story. One cannot overemphasize the significance of these tales. On the one hand, they bore witness to the importance of Loch Derg as a place of pilgrimage. On the other hand, they contributed to its fame. At home, through the medium of tales based on folklore, they enshrined the pilgrimage in the tradition of the country. Abroad, they carried the not yet extinct pagan idea that somewhere across the ocean, in the most westerly land of the world, Access to the beyond was possible, and the extent of this fame is evident from the daring journeys that bold knights from afar undertook to go there. And by the way, 
the writer of this presentation, uh, John B. Cunningham, has completed the lockdown pilgrimage, that's the whole three-day pilgrimage, more than a dozen times. John also um, appeared uh, in a one-hour television film called The Lovers of the Lake as the prior of Loch Derg. And John's second book was called Loch Derg, The Legendary Pilgrimage. More a little bit about the book um, later. So we talked a little bit earlier about the location of Loch Derg uh, geographically, and it's uh, situated in uh, modern uh, County Donegal. Dr. Parigo Rian has discussed the emergence of religious settlements in such areas of no man's lands between powerful neighbours. It was desir desirable that a buffer area should arise uh, between these powerful neighbours. Normally these were in sort of disputed territorial border areas between these powerful and often warring uh, clans. So in order to try and uh, stop uh, the wars um, or the skirmishes or disputes erupting in the full-scale war, monastic sites would uh, often be located in these buffer zones and that uh, developed into German lands and this would provide uh, revenue for the foundation of the monastic site and act as a place of sanctuary. In the case of Loch Derg and Termin McGrath, Termin Amungan and what would collectively be known as Termin Davog, these powerful neighbours were the O'Donnells of Turconnell, modern County Donegal, and the O'Neills of Tyrone, and the less powerful Maguires of County Fermanagh in the southeast. So the McGraths as uh, Corubs in the Termin occupied this buffer zone and they occupied it successfully for hundreds of years. We know from the medieval sources that uh, pilgrims would travel uh, from across Europe uh, to Loch Derg, which of course for them was in the far western reaches of the known world. Um, this could be an often difficult and dangerous journey. And we know that pilgrims would uh, travel for some part of that journey by boat. Um, boarding boats in the town of Enniskillen, they could safely travel along Loch Erne before uh, coming ashore at the mouth of the river, of the Termin River, uh, and just south of the modern town of Pedico. On the map on the right hand side is the old pilgrimage route from the shore of Loch Erne to Loch Derg. Marked with the green arrow is the mouth of the Termin River, and not coincidentally, it is also the location of the McGrath Castle. Pilgrims would then, by foot, travel the road uh, that leads north, uh, north uh, from the town of Pedigo towards uh, the shore of Loch Derg, then board boats to Station Island. Station Island is not the only island of Loch Derg with a significance for the clan McGrath. Also is Saints Island. Saints Island has a particular interest because that was a monastic settlement and also a cemetery. And we'll look at an Im image um, of the island which marks some of those key locations. In this image uh, you can see uh, pilgrims on boats uh, boarding from the shore uh, crossing Loch Derg to Station Island and to St Patrick's Purgatory. However, let's turn our attention to Saints Island, which lies northwest of Station Island. The Annals of Ulster record that there was a monastic settlement on Saints Island for many years and that had some political importance having been raided on a number of occasions. 
However, in the 12th century, a dramatic change occurred with the arrival of the Augustinian canons, who were introduced into Ireland in the 1140s by St Malachy and installed in the monastery of St Silent, which became a priory dependent for Augustinian canons on the Abbey of St Peter and Paul in Armagh. They were certainly responsible for the creation of the pilgrimage under the patronage of St Patrick. Henry of Psaltry declares this indirectly when he states that St Patrick gave the church and the care of the purgatory to the Augustinian canons. This is of real interest to the clan McGrath because in later years the annals record that McGraths became priors um, of the priory and also of course uh, in tandem the carbs of the termin which the priory was situated in. If we draw our attention to the map on the screen you will note it records the site of the original priory but very interestingly there is marked a graveyard. This may be the grave site for the McGrath chieftains, uh, the Carabs and the Priors of Loch Derg and of course the Termin, Termin Davok. So this archaeologically could be of real significance uh, to the clan McGrath. We'll learn a little bit about a further cemetery on the mainland uh, which is also very ancient but actually has very few McGrath's, McGrath graves uh, within it. So a really interesting um, suggestion that potentially Saints Island holds the graves of many McGrath ancestors and particularly the McGrath chieftains, the Corabs on the prayers of Loch Derg. We're lucky that John B. Cunningham has written a book titled Loch Derg Legendary Pilgrimage. It was published in 1984 and has 102 wonderful pages with illustrations and a history of the prayers, the Corabs, the McGraths and our neighbours, uh, the Maguires of uh, County Fermanagh. So we've looked a little at about the history and the location of uh, Loch Derg and the pilgrimage island uh, located in it. Now let's turn our attention to uh, the Terminal McGraths. So the Terminal lands were associated with the monastery and were administered for hundreds of years by the Terminal McGrath family. The papal bull of Pope Boniface VIII in 1296 was the basis of an elaborate agreement between the Primate of Armagh and the Bishop of Clocher, the Clocher Diocese being the diocese where the actual uh, island um, of Loch Derg uh, and the Loch itself is located. So the Armagh Bishop, the Bishop of Armagh, the Primate of Armagh and the Bishop of Clocher were on one side and the McMahons and the Maguires, uh, local clans, were on the other. This allowed uh, this agreement uh, was reached that rendered all church land and its occupiers practically free of all civil uh, jurisdiction. The Termin was practically a little kingdom on its own and in the annals the McGraths are described as Corab or Coraba of the Termin. So we look back at this idea of a little kingdom and if we go back to the historical record, we can look, look at a particular uh, pilgrim, a medieval pilgrim to St. Patrick's Purgatory, uh, who travelled from Hungary. He himself is a Hungarian nobleman, George Grisafan, and in 1353 he made his way to the island. Now, as we've mentioned previously, this can be a particularly dangerous uh, journey traveling right across Europe um, but we do know that George entered the cave on Station Island to complete the pilgrimage and we have a quote 
um, from some texts that describe George's journey. George, having made the sign of the cross, moved them as though they were only the weight of a feather, that is, some stones that were nearby. The prior, who alone keeps the key to the door of the cave, then opened it at George's request in the sight of all. Party to those proceedings were not only the convent, but the king of that country, the McGrath, who from devotion wished to be there for the occasion with many other noblemen. When the door had been opened, the prior solemnly vested with his servants, as is the customary practice, blessed George, and George entered. Now the really interesting thing for us is of course um, the presence of the McGrath and the recording of that in the 14th century. So we know that uh, from various medieval um, texts that uh, pilgrims travelled um, to uh, the Termin uh, to take part in uh, the pilgrimage at St Patrick's Purgatory on Loch Derg. However, what do we know of the McGrath Terminers themselves? Well, we've seen the medieval text which mentions the McGrath, but actually the bulk of our information comes from the annals, that is, the annals of Ulster and the annals of the Four Masters, which were recorded by monks in the medieval period. Uh, they recorded uh, major events, so often deaths, um, births, marriages, etc. Um, a kind of a public record of the time, but that record those major events um, associated with uh, major places. So the Termin itself, and because of its location, um, wedged between the O'Donnells of Tyrconnell, the O'Neills of Tyrone and uh, the Maguires of Fermanagh, uh, became an important place and we have much that was recorded. So we're going to take a little look at the annals themselves. So as terminers, we can see that from 1290, the McGraths make an appearance as the corps of uh, Termin Davog. So uh, in 1290, we see that Gal McGrath was corps of Termin Davog and he died. He died in 1290, so we can assume that he was corps for some time before his actual death. So, probably from around the mid 13th century. In 1340, we see that Nicholas the Carp died. So, some 50 years after Gala dies, we see that Nicola the Carp dies, and that is also recorded in the annals. And in 1384, we see that Lucia, the wife of uh, Moorish McGrath, the Carp dies. Um, so again, we can see that there is a history of the recording of the Corrup of Loch Derg, major events associated with them. Let's turn to the sanctuary then itself and where it's mentioned in the annals. In 1395, the old Muldoon, chief of Lurg, captured treacherously at the Termin by Art Maguire's son and was slain. The Muldoons had their headquarters in the hills above the present village of Lack in County Fermanagh, in the townland of C. Muldoon, or Muldoon's seat. They were described as large, round-headed men at the barony of Lurg, whose prowess was such that a few of them could beat a funeral of men from any other barony. And that's John O'Donovan writing about Fermanagh in 1834. Turning back to the annals, in 1423, the McGrath of the Termin, Mark, son of Morris, or Morris, died, and his brother Sean Moore was made Corriba. So uh, Sean Moore is effectively translated as uh, Big Sean. Uh, so he was uh, made Corriba in 1423. So Let's look at the McGraths and their hospitality. This was a key duty of being a corrupt. Uh, hospitality was very important in Gaelic Ireland. 
1434, sorry, 1435, the McGrath the chairman, Sean Moore, died. He was a gentleman who maintained a house of hospitality for all. Again, one of the duties of the determiner was to provide hospitality for the pilgrims, strangers and poor travellers. In 1440, the McGrath, the carb of the determiner, Matthew, son of Mark, died. And Sean Bu, son of Sean Moore, made Carb the same year. So we can see a history here of that hereditary office of a Carb passing down through a family line. In 1455, Raymond Maguire is Prior of Loch Derg. This is the first record of Maguire and marks the expansion of the Maguires into the Termin. So now let's look at the breaches of the Termin Sanctuary. As we mentioned before, uh, the Termin was a place where people could seek uh, refuge. It was also a place uh, which, if you like, was demilitarised. In other words, this could be a place where disputes could be settled between um, warring factions and families. However, this wasn't always the case. And the sword was brought into the Termin and uh, people uh, were killed on a number of occasions. This example uh, from the Annals of 1471 tells us that Alcola, the son of Hugh Maguire, and his sons slew Rory, uh, son of Donka, son of Hugh Maguire, at the house of the McGrath. So this was uh, a Rory Maguire who had obviously come into the Termin and sought sanctuary at the Terminer's house. However, he wasn't spared. Uh, Rory, uh, the son of Donka, uh, son of Hugh Maguire at the house of the McGrath in the Termin, uh, was followed uh, and Cola uh, slew him. Cola's son was killed the next day. Again, uh, mentions to the vengeance of God and St. Davog. So almost as a revenge uh, killing for profaning the actual sanctuary of the Termin. So we can see that violence was used and was brought into the Termin. It wasn't always a demilitarized zone or a place of peace. So let's have a look at some other breaches of the Termin that are recorded in the annals. So as we turn our attention to the early 1500s, we can see that the annals record in 1507 that a Duncan McGrath was at that time the prior of St. Patrick's Purgatory. As we move on to 1522, we can see a violation of the Termin as a place of sanctuary and, if you like, a demilitarized zone when Hugh O'Neill and his troops marched up the Derg River through the Termin to Tier Hugh. Tier Hugh being a, a barony which lies southwest to the Termin lands. What the annals record here is the violation of the Termin uh, by its use as a route by an armed troop of O'Neill's uh, soldiers. In 1524, we see that Sean Bew, who's the son of Andrew McGrath, the Terminer, who was the Terminer at that time, a man of most esteem and influence in Ulster died. In 1527, William, son of Andrew McGrath, a man of wealth who kept a house of hospitality for all, and his wife, both died within one day and one night. So as we mentioned previously, the annals record these as important um, events. Um, what we can also um, see that uh, the violation of the chairman with the O'Neill troops marching through it was also important enough to record in the annals. It should be noted, however, that uh, there is a link between the O'Neill, um, a link of kinship, um, and tradition holds that Archbishop Minor McGrath as a boy was fostered to the O'Neills of Tyrone and became foster brother uh, to Shane Proud O'Neill. Um, so that's a quite an interesting uh, connection. But let's have a look at another O'Neill violation of the Chairman. So perhaps not so much a violation as a feud. In 1536, the annals tell us that the McGrath of the Termin 
fasted against the sons of blind Hugh O'Neill. In revenge, the O'Neills raided the Terman, and they killed the McGrath's son, Seamus, and Prior McGrath's son, Nicholas. This is um, an extremely violent time, and of particular interest is this feud, which sees the McGraths losing two probably quite young um, but strong men. It was a bad year for the McGraths as they had already lost three sons, dying natural deaths, and these two being killed as a result of this feud. The deaths themselves uh, were instigated by the McGraths fasting against the sons of blind Hugh O'Neill. Uh, fasting was an ancient Irish legal device to force the other party to agree to arbitration uh, through and by the Breton law, which may result in some form of uh, compensation. So the claimants in this case, the McGraths, would have gone to the O'Neill's property and remained there without eating for a day and a night to put public pressure on the O'Neills, and you can probably imagine the spectacle, fasting outside the house and drawing such attention to them. And this instigated, it appears, this raid into the Termin and the murder, um, killing of two members of the McGrath clan of the Termin. So we mentioned fasting, and this was, as we said, a very ancient Irish practice which by this period seems to only to have been confined to ecclesiastics, and even for them the church's traditional prestige was now so low that the O'Neills felt able to exact terrible revenge. So we're moving into this sort of mid-16th century period um, where we see the change in the social structures and government and um, political alliances in Ireland. So... And the ancient practice of fasting would have um, been a very important device um, to exact arbitration through the Breton law. But by this period, the O'Neills felt that they could uh, go and take this terrible revenge. So the quarrel must have been very serious indeed, since not only were these two families from neighbouring parishes, in fact, but they were also closely related. And as we mentioned before, in fact, uh, Archbishop Mayer McGrath, as a young man, may have been uh, fostered into the O'Neills themselves and become foster foster brother to Shane the Proud O'Neill, who would eventually become King of Ulster. So between 1538 and 1562, we see uh, really the last entries um, in the Annals of Ulster, which relate to the McGraths of Chairman McGrath. But that's not the end of the story. Um, not by a long stretch, in fact. We know that by 1570, that uh, Bishop Myler McGrath was the Anglican Bishop of Clocher, and by 1571, he was Archbishop of Cashel and County Tipperary. Myler himself was the son of uh, the Termin, uh, was born in Ulster, educated on the continent, and uh, eventually had uh, a very long career um, as a bishop and archbishop. Uh, the end of the Gaelic uh, era in Ireland um, ended in the early 17th century uh, following the Battle of Conceal. However, there were opportunities um, to obtain lands and uh, titles up to that particular date. And Archbishop Mayer McGrath was very forward in taking these opportunities on. So we'll, we'll have a look at um, what was called a surrender and regrant and how that affected uh, the Clan McGrath in Ulster and um, the extension and expansion of their own property there. So we talked a little about the political changes in the late 16th century and early 17th century. And the expansion of Queen Elizabeth's uh, rule in Ireland. Between 1540 and 1603, a system was put in place called Surrender and Regrant. This was a legal mechanism by which Irish clans 
were to be converted from a power structure rooted in clan and kin loyalties to a late feudal system under the English legal system. Now, uh, this also created opportunities. Um, so those uh, clans which held lands, for instance, uh, the Termin lands, could be granted under the new English system the rights to those particular lands. So they never did miss an opportunity. Uh, Archbishop Maida McGrath, who was, of course, the Anglican Archbishop of Cashel uh, from uh, 1571 to 1622, made a petition of, uh, for the surrender of his father's Termin lands to uh, Queen Elizabeth I. And following this particular partition in 1596, on the 5th of May, Duncan McGrath, Archbishop Mel McGrath's father, uh, and chieftain of Termin McGrath, surrendered all his Termin lands to the Queen for a reduction to English tenure and a regrant to himself and his family. On May the 13th, the same lands were regranted to Duncan by Queen Elizabeth I, and these included all the lands of both Termin McGrath and Termin Limbongan. Uh, collectively uh, known as Termin Dabog, and actually quite a large swathe of land. In 1610, on the 22nd of December, a further grant of title was made to James McGrath, the son of Archbishop Menor McGrath. He received that grant and title to the same lands from the new king, James I. We're fortunate to have the text of the grant of title from 1610, um, which uh, gave James McGrath the uh, title to the lands that were in the confines of counties Fermanagh, Tyrone and Donegal, and included the site of the late priory, monastery or friary of Kennans of Loch Derg. Uh, the title also includes some rights, which uh, uh, includes a Saturday market and a fair on the 16th of July, and the day after, and also to receive the moiety of fugitives and felons' goods. It also um, allows for the dividing up of uh, the lands um, and uh, the building of a manor house and domains of 300 acres or thereabouts, to build a capital house within seven years, and to have a court barn in each manor. So uh, quite interesting rights that come with that particular uh, title. You can uh, find a copy of the title on the website www.clamagrab.org. So we've heard much about Archbishop Minor McGrath uh, throughout this presentation, particularly in the latter periods of the McGrath occupation of the Termin lands. And of course, he was uh, responsible uh, for the much of the surrender and regrant, and the continuation of uh, McGrath uh, over, oversight and ownership of the Termin lands, uh, well into the seventeenth century. So Archbishop Mary McGrath was actually born um, in the Termin lands, uh, the son of Duncan McGrath, who was uh, the carb of uh, the Termin. He entered the Franciscan order um, in the early uh, 16th century. He was born himself in 1521, 1522. Uh, he entered the Franciscan order and eventually uh, went uh, to the continent uh, to study for the church. He eventually uh, obtained a bishopric of a uh, Catholic bishopric of uh, Down and Connor in Ireland. Um, and there is uh, much work has been done, uh, uh, particularly in recent years, on tracing his particular journey and his particular story. We do know, of course, that he uh, became um, uh, a Protestant uh, uh, Anglican uh, bishop of Clocker um, and a Catholic uh, bishop of Down and Connor at the same time. He was uh, deprived of the Catholic uh, bishopric of Down and Connor by Rome in 1580 for heresy and other matters. 
Thus he enjoyed dual appointments as Roman Catholic and Church of Ireland prelates for uh, nine years and all of the advantages uh, that came with it. In 1570, um, he was appointed um, the Bishop of Clocker, the Anglican Bishop of Clocker, and visited England where he apparently fell ill of a fever. In February 1571, he was then appointed Archbishop of Cashel and Bishop of Emily, and uh, brought 150 or so uh, relatives as a personal uh, bodyguard from uh, Ulster uh, in the modern Pedigo area, but in in the Termin and the surrounding areas. These acted as his personal bodyguard um, in uh, Cashel, and we know that those McGraths who went with him, but uh, uh, settled um, in County Tipperary and the surrounding uh, counties and are there to this day. He also brought um, other families with him, particularly uh, McMenamins and Monaghan's uh, from Ulster, who also uh, settled in that area. So much work has been done and written um, about Madame McGrath, but of particular interest to our uh, own clan history. It was a fantastic book um, called Archbishop Madame McGrath, The Enigma of Cashel, uh, written by Father Patrick uh, J. Ran. This uh, scholarly book on Mailer is published by Lachine Publications, Ross Cray. And uh, it is a really in-depth and wonderful look into uh, the life of Mary McGrath and his role as Archbishop. So we know that by 1610, uh, James McGrath had been awarded a grant title um, to the lands um, of the Termin. We know that the castle um, had been completed uh, and built in the late uh, 16th century. So the Clan McGrath in the particular area um, were well placed. However, uh, the, the plantation of Ulster and the decline of um, uh, Gaelic power uh, put pressure on Irish Gaelic uh, families. In 1641, um, a rebellion in Ireland uh, broke out um, and this uh, instigated uh, a long and bloody uh, conflict. Uh, during this rebellion, uh, the Clan McGrath came under uh, pressure uh, in Ulster and eventually uh, the castle uh, was destroyed. The Termin lands themselves uh, passed into the hands of the Leslie family of Glasslock, who held the lands for really for the next uh, 300 years. However, that's not the end of the story of the Clan McGrath. The Clan McGrath um, extended and expanded uh, from their original term of lands uh, across the, the many counties, the nine counties of Ulster, and um, have uh, a long and a proud history, um, which we've had an opportunity to speak about uh, today. So thank you for um, listening, and a huge thanks to uh, John B. Uh, Cunningham for putting together this presentation. I hope you find it uh, both interesting and inspiring to uh, learn more. Uh, for further information on the Clan McGrath Society, uh, please uh, go to our website www.clanmcgrath.org. You'll also find uh, links to our social media pages, both uh, Facebook and uh, Twitter. So once again, my name is uh, Sean Alexander McGrath. Uh, thank you for joining me today. And we look forward to uh, speaking with you soon. Um, enjoy the rest of this online clan gallery.